Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining in. Um, I'm actually going to get started right on schedule to make sure that we can make the most of our time and also so that I leave um, plenty of room at the end for questions and answers if you guys have them. Okay, so just as a quick introduction, uh, my name is Dana and I am part of the Gray Muzzle team. Now, prior to that, I spent the last seven years um, specializing in strategic engagement and relationship building for animal welfare organizations. Now, strategic planning is um, all about building real one-on-one -on -one relationships with your audience through meaningful interactions that um, inspire action and foster long-term loyalty. So of course, social media um, is one of the most powerful tools for that. It lets us engage with our communities directly and every single day, um, you know, but there is a catch <laughs> in that it's really very emotionally um, and mentally demanding, uh, largely because one of the toughest challenges is saying the same thing over and over again, without losing creativity or impact. So for today's webinar, um, I focused it around a question that I hear all the time, which is why is my engagement tanking? And um, you know, while it's easy to blame the algorithms, the reality is that your audiences are evolving and changing. So they are consuming content very differently and they have um, their expectations for content has really changed. So to be successful on social, we need to be evolving with them. And that means becoming um, what I call value offering content creators. So with that, um, I'm excited to present the top 10 ways to kill your social media. And this is part of our grantee webinar series. This session is all about helping amazing teams like yours, um, who are obviously working tirelessly for the animals in your care. And of course, senior dogs alongside of us. Now, what you can expect from today, I have broken down this discussion um, into five post killers, uh, which are going to cover the fundamentals of creating content pieces, primarily captions and uh, media that you're using, and then also five engagement killers. And these will focus on humanizing your content so that you can deepen the relationships with your supporters uh, by encouraging conversation and participation. So uh, my goal for you today um, is to make sure that you can leave with practical and easy to implement tips um, that will hopefully lighten your social media workload and make your efforts more impactful. Um, and um, because I know it's gonna be a lot of information to take in, I have put together a virtual goodie bag for you, which you'll get after the webinar is over. Um, and it will include quick guides and content ideas uh, based on everything that we cover today and also include a recording of this um, discussion. Now, um, where is my question box? I don't even know. Uh, so before we dive in, um, I just wanna acknowledge um, all of you that are running your social media accounts and let you know that I am aware that social media is a huge responsibility. And oftentimes that's kind of oversighted and undervalued by external people. Um, and I also understand that most of you that are running your, your social media profiles probably didn't expect um, to be doing that or don't really have any formal training uh, in social media engagement. But, you know, you're doing it for the animals um, in your care, and that's just such a huge testament to your dedication. So I just want to let you know that I see you and um, I deeply appreciate you. Now, I am going to um, leave time for questions at the end, but I do encourage you um, throughout, you know, throughout the webinar, if you want to, you can use the chat box um, to drop questions or share in your feedback. Okay, and with that, let's get started. So the first uh, post killer, we're gonna kick off with what I call generic content, content syndrome. Now, what is it? It's really when you are sticking to, um, oops, sorry. It's really when you're sticking to the same outdated content practices and you're expecting to have different or better results than you've been seeing. 
So this also happens when you rely on what I call cookie cutter templates to try to create what's supposed to be authentic content for your audiences. And why is this harmful? Well, your audience isn't looking for perfectly curated content anymore. They're scrolling very fast um, through their feeds and they only stop when they feel a real or very personalized connection to your content. And that's when they'll engage and it increases the chances that they will donate or consider adopting. So if all of your posts are looking the same to your audiences, they have the same captions or they have the same type of photos, um, it doesn't have the impact that you're going to want it to have on your audience because they've kind of become desensitized to it. Um, so I want you to think about um, an animal in your shelter who is everybody's favorite. And I can guarantee that there is a specific animal that comes to mind. And when you're imagining them, you're thinking, um, you're not thinking about like how perfectly they sit for a photo or whether or not they're good for, with kids or like how much they weigh. But um, instead you're, you know, you're probably thinking about a quirky personality trait or a sweet disposition, um, or maybe even like a little imperfection that makes them, you know, really adorable. So these are the types of um, feelings that we have about an animal that makes them real for you. And it's what makes you feel emotionally connected to them in ways that you don't connect to all of the other animals that are in your care. And we really want to capture that essence and that feeling in content when we're posting on social media. So when you are relying on repetitive generic content for pet promotions, you are really denying animals the chance to show what makes them truly unique. And um, when you do that, you also miss opportunities to trigger an emotional response from your audience that connects them uh, to that animal through your content. Um, I also want to mention that this, you know, this applies to all of your content, so not just for pet promotions. Um, so you need to include what I call emotional, educational, or entertainment value. Uh, that gives your audience a reason to stop scrolling and feel a connection that makes them want to invest in taking the time to read what you're sharing. Just want to pull up my chat box for a second here. Uh, sorry, many screens. Okay. Um, so what should you be doing instead of generic content posting? Um, well, the key is to offer your audience a vicarious experience. So this is something that your audience that makes your audience feel like they are right there with you, seeing and feeling a moment as if it's happening in real time. So the next time that you're taking a photo, I want you to ask yourself, how can I make this feel more real for my audience? And instead of going for a perfectly curated shot, you know, focus on capturing a little quirk or a special trait about an animal that makes them stand out. And um, again, this doesn't have to apply to just animals or pet promotions, whether you're asking for donations or fosters, give your audience a first person perspective or a behind the scenes look at your shelter's daily life to better help them understand the impact value. Um, so people in general, they really want to feel like they're a part of something meaningful. And when you offer them that first person point of view, you really help them to build a more genuine connection with your organization and also with the pets that you're promoting. Um, so to show you what I mean, I have um, a couple of examples of photos here that have performed really well for us. And you can see it's a subtle change from perfectly curated to, um, you know, just these mostly dogs acting pretty goofy, which is just who they are innately. Um, and then this is also just capturing a moment that was witnessed and experienced from somebody that was in the shelter staff. But, you know, these photos all are evoking personalized emotions. And um, that is really what makes people stop scrolling and paying attention. So again, the, the goal is to make people feel something special and emotional through your content. So now we're gonna move on to post killer number two, which is stuck on stills. And what does this mean? Um, this is an over-reliance on static images in your feed. So keep in mind, there's definitely a time and place for beautifully staged images, but it just can't be your entire feed. So that repetitiveness of this one type of content is what is the killer here. Um, and why is it harmful? 
Well, static images really just don't perform as well when they're not mixed with other dynamic content. Um, so this would be content that is conversation sparking or that has what I call entertainment value. And if you're stuck on stills, you're really missing out on opportunities to also use um, other features and tools like stories and reels uh, that promote conversation and then therefore boost your visibility. Um, and then lastly, also when you are oh, gonna have when you focus, um, it's me. Uh, when you're only focusing on staged photos, it really takes the fun out of capturing content uh, for your team. So if you want more engaging content, I um, certainly recommend giving your team a space to share their most meaningful moments um, with the animals. This is also a really good team camaraderie building exercise because the content that they have most of the time taken is very real and it's very emotionally powerful, but they normally don't share it because either A, they don't feel like it fits into that perfectly staged, professionally photographed style, or um, there is no easy place for them to actually drop it or they don't know where to put it. So what should you be doing instead? Simply, you just want to incorporate more dynamic, interactive content into your social media strategy. And um, oops, one of the easiest ways and most impactful ways to do that is to start using stories. Now, I like to use stories in Instagram and then cross post it to Facebook just because it's easier and there's often more features available. Um, but they really are a, go a gold mine for increasing engagement and reach um, because they let you add interactive elements like polls and <laughs> polls, quizzes, and lots of fun stickers. Um, so inside of stories, you can also mix in short form videos uh, here. And as we know from TikTok, people love very quick uh, bite-sized pieces of content that they can sift through very quickly. So um, once you start using stories, I think that it helps people to get more comfortable with creating reels because you're using different features um, and you're understanding the way that people respond to it a little bit better. So I know that reels can come across as intimidating, but really they, they truly do not have to be anything fancy or anything overly curated. So like we talked about earlier, it's really just about offering a point of view experience, but, um, you know, with a, with a movie, uh, I'm sorry, with a video, it's a live action format of that um, perspective and reels are great for that. Um, now, I'm not going to show you how to use reels and stories here, but I have included in your virtual goodie bag 210 content ideas. Uh, which will walk you through how to recycle content pretty easily to use all of the features um, for, you know, if you have one piece of content or one story, how to share it on all three of these formats to make, to maximize the effectiveness um, of it. But um, I want to show here, um, this example is a real um, and I want to show you the effectiveness of it because this is a simple nine second video of the point of view of a senior dog on his ride home after being adopted. And it is not fancy. You can't even see the dog's face, but it just let, um, you know, the audiences experience that moment alongside of the adopter as it was happening. So this type of real time first person perspective um, really was very, um, was very successful. And it resulted in this two week period, um, almost 19,000 engagements over 313,000 plays. And at the same time, increased the Facebook following, um, just under a thousand again, in that very short period of time. So it's really just all about giving people a chance to feel those moments together and concerning yourself significantly less with making it look perfect. Okay, so moving on to post killer number three, which is assuming people will read. So what is this? <laughs> um, it's when we lean way too hard into an overly emotional text heavy caption. And this one is really attempting, especially in the animal welfare world where we've all got like a lot of feelings and very, very many opinions that we want to share. Um, 
But why is it harmful? Well, it's ignoring what's called TLDR behavior, which is too long, didn't read. And yes, that is actually a marketing behavior that has been studied. Um, and it is 100% an engagement killer. So people's attention spans today are very, very, very short. And if your caption looks like a wall of text, people are going to scroll past and not even look at it at all. Um, and I know that you might be thinking like, okay, but I have to say all of the right things to inspire that one right person to take action. Excuse me. And trust me, I, I get that type of anxiety writing uh, because you want to have an impact. But here's the problem. When we do this, we often end up over explaining and doing what I call verbal vomiting, which is where you're really just spewing too much information at your audience. And instead of drawing them in, you're kind of just actually like grossing them out a little bit. <laughs> um, so long captions really make your audience feel overwhelmed instead of inspired. And that is, you know, not what we want. So what should we do instead? Simply just get to the point. So I, I, I say this, you know, think about a time when you sat through a really long, boring meeting. And by the end of it, your only takeaway was that like totally could have been an email. So that's the mindset that I want you to take when you're creating captions is that simplicity works best and you don't want to waste people's time. Um, so when writing a post, I want you to ask yourself, what is the point of this post? And if the purpose is to promote a pet or raise money, just say that directly and write in the beginning and use as few words as possible to get to that point. So you don't need to turn your, you know, your captions into an everyday adoption counseling or overshare personal opinions. Yes, you can story tell, but, um, but social media storytelling follows very different rules than creative writing. So one sentence paragraphs are totally fine. You want to use a lot of space between paragraphs and you want to be as clear and concise as possible. So my own personal rule, generally speaking, is that whatever I have written initially, I usually try to cut out at least half of it if possible. Um, I want to note here that if you are using chat GPT with captions, you need to be very clear in your prompt instruction that it is to remove fluffy words and be concise when it provides the caption, because that thing naturally defaults to like, an unnecessarily wordy caption that is actually counterproductive to the success that you're seeking in using it. Um, okay, so I am going to show you my caption writing guide and I'm gonna provide two options here, uh, two examples here. The top example is going to be an impact focused and trust building, ex uh, trust building update that we're providing our community. And the second is going to be a fundraiser campaign post. So the first, um, in the very first sentence, you should be delivering the main point of your story or post in 15 words or less and ideally before it truncates. What I mean by that is on mobile view, you only get um, two lines at max uh, before the wording um, minimizes and says, click here if you wanna read more. So we wanna make sure that our entire point of our posts happens before that truncates. Um, uh, the next thing that you wanna do is you wanna elaborate with more context in paragraphs that have between one and three sentences max per paragraph. And please use bullet points whenever possible and also use emojis to emphasize emotions um, wherever, wherever possible and appropriate. And then last, um, you want to go ahead and either reiterate the main point um, of the post, or you want to add a strong call to action that instructs your audience exactly what you want them to do next. Okay, so post killer number four, all about me copywriting. What is this? So this happens when your content is um, overly self-centered and focuses solely on your organization's needs without actually considering what your audience cares about. Um, so this, um, these types of captions essentially say you should help us because we need your help without giving people a reason to feel 
personally invested in your cause or acknowledging what your community gains from supporting you. Um, and why is this harmful? Well, it's like being in a one-sided relationship where you're always taking, but you're never giving. So when every post centers around, we need this or help us now, it starts to feel very transactional and even a little bit entitled. So this creates a disconnect um, and it sets a high expectation for your community's support as if people should and will keep giving without fully understanding why they should or um, why they should want to or what the results are happening from their, um, their investing in your organization. So people are far less likely to engage when they feel like they're being used, taken for granted, or they just don't understand what's in it for them. Um, and when you don't offer value in return or make your audience feel appreciated, you risk losing their attention and, of course, their trust. So without trust, you know, you're going to lose the um, ability to inspire meaningful connections with your with your supporters. So what should you do instead? Simply, you just want to shift from all about me writing to all about you copywriting. Um, you're going to want to speak directly to supporters like you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And you're going to do that by reframing your context to use you, your, instead of we, our, and always focus on including what's in it for your supporters. Um, so people are really motivated by, again, what benefits them and what's in it for them. So that could be either feeling good about making a difference or knowing their actions are leading to measurable impact. So you want to make sure that every caption includes um, a very specifically defined value for them. So for an example, um, instead of saying Max is looking for a home, you want to offer, uh, offer emotional and entertainment value and instead say, imagine waking up to ears like this every morning. Um, when it comes to asking for don donations, again, you want to show how their contribution has a direct impact value. So instead of saying something like we need donations, you can instead say your support will get Max the $1,500 surgery he needs or your donations clear our $10,000 vet debt so we can rescue more dogs like Max. Again, it's about building trust and showing how um, how your supporters actions are leading to real results that they can actually quantify. Um, and also on that note, you wanna make sure that you're following up with those results. So you always want to create a post ask highlight, uh, something like 327 animals received preventative care vaccinations last month thanks to your donations, or your support placed 75 pets in homes at our adoption event this weekend. So again, you just want to make them feel part of those very specifically defined wins. And um, over here, I've included an example of a post that is highlighting a senior care plan that was funded by a Gray Muzzle grant. Um, and this shows our donors exactly how their contributions had an impact for senior dogs. And it also created a balanced emotional and logical connection to their impact. Um, and when you structure your content like this, it opens the door um, for your audience to really um, resonate with the impact that they're having and for it to be very personalized for them as well. And you can see from these comments, um, this type of post did resonate with them personally. They totally understood why their contribution and the senior care plan had an impact and the benefit to themselves and to um, potential other senior adopters. And it created meaningful conversations um, around this topic um, and also increase, therefore, engagements by result, as a result. So post, uh, yeah, post killer number five is, sorry, um, broken record hooks. So what is this? Um, it is when the first sentence of your caption is repetitive and uninspired, um, and it makes you sound like a broken record. So I want you to kind of think about how many times you've started a caption with meet pet name or we need fosters. These are repetitive hooks. Um, and why is this harmful? Well, it leads to audience boredom and disengagement. 
So it's kind of similar to generic content syndrome and all about me copywriting, but it's very specific to the first sec, sec uh, I'm gonna for, first sentence of your caption. Um, you can't keep expecting people to respond to we need fosters when you post that in the future if they've already ignored it a hundred times before. You really need to be getting more creative. So again, you want to remember that your audience is not scrolling through Facebook actively looking to adopt, foster, or volunteer on their lunch break. Um, so it's your job to figure out how to make someone pause on your content and go, wait, like, what is, what is this about? I want to pay attention. So what should you do instead? You want to use what's called shock and awe strategies. And this is all about grabbing people's attention within that first sentence using surprising, provocative, and curiosity peaking hooks that make your audience stop and stop scrolling and think again, like, wow, you know, what is this? I want to pay attention and read more about this. Um, and this focuses purely on reframing that, again, that opening line in your caption that gets supporters invested in what you have to say. So instead of saying, we need fosters, you can instead try something like five reasons you need a foster pet in your life. And this piques people's curiosity and naturally makes them wonder, does any of this apply to me? Um, so they'll keep reading more. Now, the goal is... Um, to shake things up while still offering entertainment, entertainment value. So your hook should make people want to read more. And this strategy, this is important, isn't just for Facebook or Instagram, but it is critical across all digital marketing. Um, and this includes other platforms, emails, web pages, fundraising cap and fundraising campaigns, all of it. So the first line of any marketing piece will determine whether or not people care enough to continue reading anything else that you have to say. Now, I know, um, because I do it all the time, writing strong hooks is trial and error. Um, and it is something that, you know, you're I, I'm not naturally good at it. I have to work very hard at it. So um, since I know that, and I know that you guys don't have the time for constant testing, I have made it easier um, and am providing you in your goodie bag with 101, 105 hook ideas. These are just examples um, designed to spark curiosity and start conversations and they're customizable so you guys can alter them in ways that they fit your audience. Um, so with that, um, that covers how to create compelling content and sort of the way that you should be structuring your captions and the type of media that you should be posting. So now we're gonna shift into um, talking about how to take that content to create a space for meaningful conversations in your community, with your community. So this brings us to engagement killer number one, which I call calls to crickets. So what is it? Uh, this is when your post either lacks a call to action altogether or doesn't have an effective one. So many people think that calls to actions are just for big asks like donations or critical capacity needs, but um, calls to actions actually should be in every post as a way to consistently connect with your audience. And why is it harmful? Well, CTAs, um, they are really the key to turning content into real engagement and action. And without them, you are missing opportunities to involve your audience. And that is whether through asking them to donate or just follow or just participate in a conversation. Now, every post is a chance for you to move your audience closer to actively supporting your uh, to actively supporting your organization. So if you're not guiding them to take the next step, you're really losing valuable opportunities to build these deeper connections and also increase the impact of each one of these uh, posts. And without clear direction, your audience is really not likely to take action, but they're often waiting for you to invite them to. So what should you do instead? Simply every day use a CTA. Um, every day in every post, you just wanna include a very clear, compelling call to action that inspires action in every post. And again, it's not just about big asks. Call to action should help you to build a habit of engagement from your audience. 
So the most effective call to actions don't really ask for money or help, but instead they invite conversation, they ask for opinions, and they encourage participation in community activities, even if that's just within your online, um, even if that's just within your online community. So the more your audience interacts with your content, the more invested they become. And then when you actually do need something bigger or more substantial, like donations or volunteers, they're significantly more likely to respond to that call to action because they already feel connected and invested in your organization. So that's when your calls to actions um, with your, uh, should. I'm sorry, that is when your calls to actions should um, tell your audience exactly what they can and should do to make a measurable impact. Um, and it will feel like a no brainer for them because they already feel familiar with you and they already feel like they want to help you. Um, and again, um, I know that called this might seem like a lot. So I am going to include 250 calls to action examples in your goodie bag. And these are just packed with ideas, again, and examples um, that can further help you to get a better understanding of how to use them properly and uh, give you starting points that you can customize yourself in the future. So engagement killer number two, that brings us to antisocial personality. And what is this? This happens when your tone and communication style feels cold, entitled, or dismissive. And it's like you're speaking at your audience instead of with your audience. So this creates an impression that your organization is somehow better than your community, and it makes your posts feel distant and unwelcoming. And why is this harmful? Well, personality and tone matter a lot on social media. So an antisocial tone immediately limits your reach and discourages supporters. Because you, you remember the goal with social media is to build a habit of engagement and develop relationships. But if your tone is you know a little on the snooty side, people aren't gonna stick around or feel like you're someone or an organization that they want to be involved with. Um, and, you know, your organization really can't function without community support. So being a likable and approachable online presence is crucial because that is often the first impression that a potential supporter has of your organization. So what should you do instead? Um, you really want to give your organization a well-defined persona. So Every organization on social media should really have a consistent and approachable personality that guides you on how you interact and communicate with your audience. So for example, at Gray Muzzle, our online persona is actually pretty much like a senior dog. So we're easygoing, compassionate, knowledgeable, and a little bit quirky. Um, and this really helps us to stay aligned in everything that we post. So having a defined persona will also help you to handle um, challenging comments or conflict with grace and empathy, which builds trust with your audience, especially those that are passively observing a situation, because you have a well-defined outline for how you do respond to everybody, whether it's a contentious comment or, um, you know, it's just, a, it's just a happy and joyful comment. Um, and when you're crafting your posts, um, it's really important to just remember that you're speaking to like-minded individuals who share your values. And you want to write in a way that shows you're here to collaborate, educate, and work alongside of your supporters as equal partners in your mission, and not let one person who is getting you riled up um, pull you away from your entire uh, personality and, and have a one side and have a one way conversation with them that is not reflective of your organization as a whole. So you really want to avoid um, letting people reel you in into talking down or misdirecting frustrations at the whole of your audience. And instead, you want to always uh, focus on building an inclusive and welcoming space that fosters long term loyalty and makes people feel like they're a part of something bigger with you. Um, and this is really the difference between having a transactional relationship with your supporters and having a community driven movement that is rooted in respect and camaraderie with your supporters.
Okay, so taking it one step further, um, we're going to talk about the engagement killer number three, which is spotlight hogging. So what is this? Um, it's when your content focuses solely on your organization without giving your audience a specific chance to share their love for their own animals. And when your posts are all about your pets and your needs, you're not creating that space for your audience to share their personal pet related experiences, which is really what their why is and the reasons why they feel aligned with you. And why is this harmful? Well, it undervalues a very simple yet effective engagement strategy, and that is inviting people to share photos and stories of their pets. Everybody loves sharing off their animals, and if you give them a place to do that, they, uh, it will immediately drive comments, likes, and interactions. So by neglecting this kind of participation and using this kind of strategy, you're missing out on a huge chance to build community and also boost your engagement scores. Um, and plus, it really just ignores a very key principle of outreach, and that is getting your community involved with you and communicating with you. So commenting um, is often the first step that people will take towards making a real connection with you. And it's, it's usually their first interaction that shows that they do truly want to be a bigger part of your community. And inviting them to engage in this way not only increase, increases visibility, but it also gives people a very non-threatening way to introduce themselves and um, join in on the conversation. So what should you do instead? Pretty simple, you wanna create a community space um, by regularly inviting your audience to participate. So you, again, we're going back to that, making it a habit to encourage engagement and encouraging them to share photos and experiences with their own pets. Um, you can go about this two different ways. The first way is to just simply set up a weekly post that asks followers to comment with a recent photo of their pet or share a, a story about their pet. This type of content is very highly engaging because it's fun and easy and it gives people a reason to, um, to interact with you. Or you can tie this more strategically into your pet promotions. So what I like to do is when you post an adoptable pet, Ask your audience to share photos of pets, of their own pets that remind them of the one that you're featuring or to like tag a friend that has a, a pet that reminds you of this one. Because if somebody loves their pet and they're obsessed with their pet, why wouldn't they want to adopt their twin, right? So it's just a very psychologically strategical movement as well. Um, so in general, you know, the point here is to give people their own time in the spotlight um, that should be part of your overall uh, strategy. And it's also a tactical and uh, relationship building uh, strategy. Um, and then this brings us to the post and ghost. This, this is probably, if I had to pick between everything I said to you today, this is probably, um, I think if you can implement one thing, this would be it. Um, because what is the post and ghost? So this is when you post something and then you completely disagree, uh, disappear from social media. There's no engagement, there's no responses to questions and there's no interaction at all with what your community is um, commenting. And why is it harmful? Well, by ghosting, you're really missing out on huge engagement opportunities. So every time somebody comments, whether it's just like, oh, I love this or how can I adopt? It's your chance to build relationships and boost engagement scores. So plat um, platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, they reward content that sparks conversation. So the more that you're interacting with comments, the more your content gets boosted because you're signaling to the algorithms that your content is worth sharing to more people simply because that content is keeping people on the, on the platform. Um, yeah, on the platforms. Um, but also, this isn't just about alg algorithms, though that doesn't hurt. Um, so engaging with your audience, it creates retention. So it makes people feel seen, valued, and included, included, which is the whole point of social media. It's meant to be a very socially engagement place to communicate through a digital means. So the most harmful consequence of ghosting, though, um, is when you are ignoring serious adopters, donors, or volunteers. And I totally get that 
maybe even 90% of people that are commenting on your posts really won't result in anything. They're passive commenters. But what about that other 10 to 20%? They could truly be willing and ready to foster, adopt, or donate, and you're missing a huge opportunity to take advantage of that. So I want you to imagine increasing your donations by 20% a month or increasing um, the adoption rate at your shelter by 20% of the month, 20% per month. What impact would that have on your organization? And when you think about it that way, you can really see why it's worth um, putting time and energy into creating these responses to your audience. So what should you do instead? The easiest thing to do is to create a daily engagement plan. Um, it could be something as simple as setting aside 15 minutes every day to reply to all comments and all messages. And I'm not talking about copy and pasted responses, but replies that make your audience feel like they've actually had a personalized experience with you. So for example, and I just put it here, um, if some, instead of just replying thanks to somebody that says this dog is adorable, I love gray muzzle pups, you can say something like, aren't seniors the best? He's available for adoption. Come meet him any day between 12 and five. This is a direct personalized response. And it also includes a very strong call to action, which can lead to an adoption, an adoption or foster placement. Um, and engaging with every com comment, I know it might seem very overwhelming, but this is probably like the one thing that I feel like meta business does well is that they make it easy to um, have this type of engagement plan because they gather um, all of your messages, tags, and comments in one place um, for Facebook and Instagram. And um, I'm not going to go into showing you exactly how to use that feature here, but I am including in your goodie bag an ultimate engagement planner, um, which does have screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions on how to um, access those, those features in Meta and how to use them um, by incorporating it into like a daily 10 to 15 minute plan. Um, and the last point of this, I do want to add that this doesn't have to be all on you. So um, I think that this is one of the easiest ways to outsource um, this task to volunteers. Um, it's really a low barrier task that doesn't require any adoption counseling. It, it doesn't require much training, but it will free up your time while keeping engagement high and minimizing missed opportunities. Again, if you have a place that you want to develop a resource, a human resource for engagement and communicating with your audience, um, especially your local audience, this is the place that I would start. And our last engagement killer is ignoring analytics. Um, so what is this? Simply, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just failing to track or analyze your social media performance. And this happens when you post content without checking to see what is actually working or what is not working for you. And um, why is it harmful? Well, ignoring analytics means just that you're missing out on these valuable insights that Meta provides for you that show you what resonates with your audience and what doesn't. Um, so social media algorithms are also always changing, but the data that you can collect from performance and analytics doesn't, doesn't lie. So it doesn't matter what's happening with the algorithms as long as you can track um, how, your, how your actions are impacting the engagement rates um, on your own social media platforms. So again, analytics will, will tell you very clearly what's grabbing attention, what's driving engagement, and what's not worth even posting again. Um, and truly, I get it that analytics can feel overwhelming, but not looking at them, I always say that it's like trying to put a piece of really complicated furniture together without an instruction manual. So you might wind up with something really cool and amazing, but you also might wind up with something that's totally dysfunctional and might wind up hurting yourself if you sit on it and break your butt when, when it falls apart. Um, so analytics, they're not there to waste your time. They are extremely helpful. Um, and when used correctly, they really can guide your strategy and ensure that you're making the most 
um, that you're you're getting the most efficient results from the, the limited time that you probably have to put into it. Um, so what should you be doing instead? Quite simply, again, you just want to regularly review your analytics and refine your posts based on what's working. Um, you can use, again, Meta's built-in analytics tool to identify your top performing posts um, and try to spot, spot patterns like uh, what content is getting the most engagement. Is it hooks that are creating, you know, are there similar hooks that are creating engagement or whoops, um, is it a specific time or a certain type of media that is performing the best? You can see all this when you analyze your, analy when you analyze your performance. Um, and again, I'm not going to dive into how to do this or where to find it, but you, uh, I do detail it in that in Ultimate Engagement Planner. Um, but I just wanted to, again, re-emphasize that analytics are truly a gold mine for, the, for you and they're there to help you. Um, so for myself personally, I track my weekly top performing posts in my own spreadsheet. Um, I add what's called weekly winners, and I use it as a guide to see what's working and also to try to identify where I might be able to even improve on the performance results. Um, this doesn't mean by any stance that um, every post is or will be perfect or outperforms itself every time, but at least by tracking these results, I'm able to um, spot trends that I think are resonating with my audience, and then I use that to try to uh, recreate that um, or experiment with making it even a little bit better in future posts. Um, so the other thing that's nice about tracking uh, performance of your posts is that when you have like a top five or top 10 posts, you can just put this into a visual reference guide for your team and post it in your shelter or send it out to your fosters and say, hey, this is the content that really resonates with our audience. And, you know, you can very easily recreate it um, here's what it looks like. Um, and that is, you know, I, I find to be a very effective way to get your, get your community involved. Uh, I'm sorry, get your team and staff involved and communicate with them what you need to, um, maximize your results on, on your social media platforms. Um, so again, just by understanding what works and what doesn't, you can continuously just improve your strategy to drive more engagement and support to your, um, to your organization. Now, if I look at my spreadsheet and uh, specifically, I am most interested in the performance results and the story type. Um, the performance analysis isn't something that I get from anywhere. It's just me looking at it and trying to identify like, okay, this was a cute, funny photo that I think separated it from the other content. This had a really strong hook that had an emotionally powerful hook. Um, about long-term companionship between a pet and a, and a pet owner. This, um, you know, was an emotion, again, an emotionally powerful hook that talked about survival of a senior dog in a, in a, in a catastrophic situation. Um, this performed really well because it was cross-posted by a tagged organization. Again, just really trying to clearly identify patterns so that I can recreate it going forward. And obviously yours is going to look different because we're a grant making organization and and um you might be a shelter or a rescue or a community engagement a, a community um a community organ focused organization but um you know either way you can definitely see from your content what is working best for you so that is basically it uh that brings us to the end of today's session um, the key takeaways, again, it's just really important to understand that social media needs to be much more intentional and it needs to be all about fo uh, focused, all about um, relationship building and creating content that is constantly evolving on what works with your audience as your audience's preferences are evolving. Um, you'll definitely get better results by focusing on your audience more and a little bit less on your needs and refining your content over time to um, find out the communication style uh, and the mix of emotional and logical um, engagement that you need to be giving your audience to increase participation and in increase actions that your audiences are, are doing when you ask. Um, so with that, I, you know, 
I think we have plenty of time. No, we can't see. Um, but I'd love to hear from you now. If you have specific questions, I see a couple of questions in the box now. I will look at those. Um, but I'd love to get your feedback as well. And of course, if you have questions later or you're watching the playback, I certainly want to be a resource for you. Um, so you can 100% um, always reach out to me directly and um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions I have. Any questions you have, not questions I have. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's see these questions. Uh, Dana, can you see the question and answer box or do you want me to field you the questions? Um, I think so. Yeah, so I can see the question and answer. Um, we slightly different rescue. So it says, such a we are a slightly different type of rescue in that our dogs actually belong to their human. That has, okay, left from just many of our pets are unable to be photographed due to safety reasons. What are your suggestions to handling this? Um, I think I would probably need more information, Kristen, on what you're uh, actually trying, the messaging that you're actually trying to relay to your audiences. Um, so maybe you can email me and, you know, you can share a little bit more and I'd be happy to, um, to, to give you some suggestions, but I certainly 100% understand what you're saying about respecting the privacy of, of those situations. And to be candid, I would actually focus significantly on why you can't promote those pets and the importance of creating a safe space while also being able to uh, share your message about what you're doing. Um, and then the second thing it says, what are your thoughts on using scheduling tools like Buffer? Um, I personally use a scheduling tool called Metro Metricool. It's very similar to Buffer. Um, as long as the scheduling tools are approved as a third-party platform through Facebook and Instagram, there is non-issue. Um, so it's just really important that you look up to see if they are a third, uh, an approved third-party um, platform, which I believe Buffer is, I think HubSpot is, um, Metricool is. Uh... So this next question says, can you talk about your thoughts on sponsoring posts? Um, after we sponsor a post, sorry, uh, can you elaborate that on me? Do you mean somebody paying for a post to be? Um, okay, yeah, so I have no problem with sponsored posts, but I think it's really important to understand that a sponsored post should not look like an ad. So you don't want to have a post that's just like a logo with a photo or something like really generic. If it looks and feels like an ad, it looks and feels like an ad to your audience and that definitely tanks engagement. So oftentimes what I like to do is, especially if you're working with like maybe somebody in the community or a brand, try to get them to give you something that you can incorporate into the daily use of your organization and then take video or, or photos of how that is incorporated into your shelter and then post that and talk about that. I hope that made that made sense. I know it might feel hard to do that, but again, when it feels just like organic and like it's a part of your organization, those type of sponsored posts tend to do significantly better. Um, if that wasn't clear to you, you can certainly again, email me. I know that sometimes there's very specific, you know, nuances. Um, I totally get that and you can, I will happily answer. Um, so the next question says, when posting uh, about an organization, an organizational fundraising event or campaign, does creating a branding template for the post add to generic content? When posting an organizational fundraiser event or campaign, does creating branding template for the post add to the generic content? So branding is important. Um, I think that there's different terms for the for the phrase branding template. So again, if it looks and feels like an ad, it's going to look and feel like an ad to your audience and that will reduce um, performance. Um, you can certainly incorporate branding into um, into your content in a way that is not disruptive and then no, that is not part of generic content syndrome. So generic content syndrome is mostly when you're using the same repeating pattern of conversation and you're never, um, you are never 
you're never going outside of that and it's not performing well. So if you're doing something that is performing well, you don't need to worry about it if it's part of the generic content syndrome. And that might include branding templates. If your branding templates are working very well, there's no need for you to change. Again, I hope I answered that correctly, but if I didn't, you're more than welcome to email me and send me more specifics and I'm happy to, you know, to respond accordingly. Um, so let's see, when there is limited time to focus on generating posts due to other responsibilities and the feed of, uh, and the feed of mostly adoptable senior style posts feels repetitive, what are some ways to get quick and engaging posts created? Um, I, so I think it's really important to understand that quality should over, overpower quantity. So, um, instead of posting 15 uh, posts in the exact same way, two to three every day, you could also reduce the amount of posts that are happening per individual dog and instead put five dogs in one post. Sometimes that changes up the feel um, for your audience, but I also recommend using stories. So you can post up to 20 stories a day. Um, I for our platform specifically, every every story that we do reaches between, you know, 700 to, to 3,000 people. Um, and that oftentimes outperforms actually what we're posting in our feed. So, and, and stories do not have to be pretty. People expect them to be sort of just thrown up there. People like to click through them very quickly. So if you are limited on time and resources, but you have a lot of content, 100% start looking into using the stories feature. Um, and let's see, anonymous, we totally understand replying to every comment when people have questions. Many times questions are clearly answered in the post. Um, where can I see more about these dogs and other cases? Um, yeah, so we're talking about now repeat offenders um, that just kind of are basically on your platform to be contentious and like they have nothing else to do with their time except make trouble. I I am a big, big believer in personal boundaries, and I also am a big believer in um, personal boundaries for your organization. So if somebody is on your feed, just 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 there to disrupt the feed, um, I have no problem hiding those comments. And I'll tell you, when you hide somebody's comment at this point in time, uh, Facebook did an update, like I want to say six months ago, where um, the person that wrote the comment and all of their friends can still see the comment, but nobody else can. So it also kind of, they don't even know that you hid the comment. Um so I am just, uh, yeah, I'm definitely a big believer in, you know, protecting your space and making sure that it feels like a safe and productive space for all of your community. And if that means hiding comments that are going to lead to unproductive conversations, there's no shame in that whatsoever. And again, it doesn't even create conflict because the person's, the person's comment that you hid um, doesn't know that you hid it anyway. Um... Any other questions? No, I think. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I just wanted to let you know, Dana, that the chat box is so complimentary and so grateful oh. for your presentation. Good. And everyone good. is so excited about the goodie bag and they're just good. happy to have um, someone with your specific talent on the gray muzzle team. So everybody has been saying very, very nice things. Awesome. Great. That's amazing. I appreciate it. And again, I think I'm probably, I think we're almost at our time, but I am, my email is up there. I'm happy to, you know, be a resource for you guys. It doesn't even have to be today or relevant to this, you know, this webinar specifically. I'm here for you guys and anything that I can do to help you. Um, I really, I really want to. And I think that will probably wrap it up for today. So thank you everybody for joining. And again, thank you for all you do. And I really appreciate, I understand your struggle with social media um, and uh, anything I can do to help you. I really want to, but just keep trying and keep, um, keep doing what you're doing. It's, it's, it's all worth it. We know that. 
um, and anything I could do to help. Again, I really, I really want to be a resource for you guys. So I think that's it. Thank you, Dana. And thanks yeah. everyone for joining. Bye.